Alright, what's going on everyone? Today we're going to be taking a look at the Lord of the Rings Commander decks and briefly going over the deck's core strategies. While we don't have time to go over all 100 cards in each deck, I'll leave a link in the description to the complete deck list if you're interested. Also, we will not be discussing the merits of Universes Beyond products. I know it's a divisive topic and I certainly have my own opinions, but today I just want to provide this overview for those who need it. So let's start with Food and Fellowship. An Abzan deck with Frodo and Sam as the partner commanders. Frodo says when you attack, if you gained 3 life this turn, the ring tempts you. And if Frodo is your ring bearer, and you've been tempted 2 or more times, you also draw a card. So the ring is sort of like the dungeons and the D&D sets. Basically every time you get tempted, you get an extra effect. That's the whole idea. So anyway, you need to gain 3 life. And that's where Sam comes in because he creates food tokens. And food tokens, of course, can be sacrificed to gain 3 life. So what this deck is actually looking to do is create food and gain 3 life. And Frodo can use that life gain to draw extra cards. So we have lots of ways to create food tokens, like with Gilded Goose, Butterbur, Tireless Provisioner, each of which can make a food token every turn. The Goose can be activated. Barter Burr makes one at the end of every turn if you don't have one. And the Provisioners make one whenever you play a land. Then we have payoffs for having food, like Banquet Guests, Feasting Hobbit, Rapacious Guests. Banquet Guests have affinity for food, making them cheaper for each food token you have. Feasting Hobbit can devour food when it enters for plus one plus one counters. And Rapacious Guests will get plus one plus one counters Whenever you sacrifice a token, it also generates food tokens and blows up in people's faces when it dies. So that's fun. And this continues throughout the entire deck. There's lots of food token producers, tons of payoffs for making and sacrificing food, and some life gain payoffs as well. The deck also has multiple alternate commanders. You can have Merry and Pippin as your commanders instead of Sam and Frodo. Merry will make 1-1 one, one tokens whenever you make food, once per turn, and Pippin can make food, then sacrifice food to pump your board. So this turns the deck into a go wide strategy where you're using the food to feed an army basically. There's also Bilbo which says when you gain life gain that much plus one. Then if you have 111 life you can sacrifice him to search your library for any number of creatures and put them all on the battlefield. So this is very unlikely but extremely powerful if you get there of course. But anyway if you like the idea of creating food tokens to power up an army of halflings be sure to check out Food and Fellowship. Next is Hosts of Mordor, a Grixis deck with Sauron, Lord of the Rings as the commander. He's an 8 mana 9-9 nine, nine with Trample. When you cast it, you'll amass Orcs 5, meaning you'll either make a 5-5 five, five Orc token, or if you already have an Orc token, then you'll put 5 plus 1 plus 1 counters on it. Then you mill 5 cards and return a creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield, and there's no restriction on that. It can be any massive creature in your graveyard. So while Sauron might be very difficult to cast, it's a big commander, but it's not going to like come in early and give you lots of advantage. But there are a lot of cards that are designed around Sauron, like a Balrog of Moria and Cavern Horde Dragon are two examples. The Balrog can be cycled for four mana and it grants two treasure tokens. This helps ramp into Sauron. And then when Sauron enters, he'll reanimate the Balrog, leaving you with an 8-8 Trampler with Haste, a 9-9 Trampler, and the 5-5 Orc token, right? So that's pretty powerful. The Dragon costs 9, but costs X less, where X is the greatest number of artifacts an opponent controls. It's Commander, right? Chances are there's going to be someone with piles of treasure or just mana rocks, stuff like that. Then it has Trample Flying Haste, and then when it hits a player, it makes a number of treasure tokens equal to the number of artifacts that player controls, which is perfect for ramping into Sauron. Another important aspect of this deck is amassing the orcs. So there are things like Corsairs of Umbar, Mouth of Sauron, and Summons of Saruman. The pirates will amass orcs 3 when it hits a player every time it hits a player. Mouth of Sauron enters, makes a player mill 3, which we like milling. We're kind of a reanimation deck. We have reanimation strategies. Then we'll amass orcs X where X is the number of instants or sorceries in that player's graveyard. And the summons will amass X in addition to milling X. And it lets you cast a spell with mana value X or less from your graveyard. And there's a lot of this self-mill and reanimation stuff. As you see with Treason of Isengard, Extract from Darkness, 
too greedily, too deep. The first amasses, then grabs the spell and puts it back on top of your library, which is great when you're milling yourself. Extract from Darkness will mill two, then reanimates any creature. And too greedily, too deep, reanimates a creature and then potentially blows up the rest of the board. So you kind of get the idea, right? We're, we're casting spells, we're amassing, and we're reanimating. The alternate commander for this one is Saruman, the White Hand, who's going to amass X whenever you cast a non-creature, where X is that spell's mana value. So as we're casting our spells and recasting them from the graveyard, he's just going to make a massive orc army. So if you want to sling Grixis spells to make an army of orcs, check out Hosts of Mordor. Next up is Riders of Rohan, a Jeskai tribal deck with Eowyn Shield Maiden at the helm. She's a 5 mana 5 4 with first strike that says at the beginning of combat, if another human entered the battlefield this turn, create 2 2 2 red human knight tokens with trample and haste. Then if you control six or more humans, you'll also get to draw a card. So it probably goes without saying, but this deck is all about producing a massive army of tokens and then pumping them up. So you have things like Prince What's-His-Face the Fair, Lawsonart Captain, and Riders of Rohan. The Prince makes a 1-1 when we draw our second card each turn. Our commander does that, and there's another uh, theme here. We'll talk about that in a second. The Captain makes a 1-1 every turn and also taps something every time a human enters the battlefield, which, you know, our commander also does does, makes multiple humans every turn, and Riders of Rohan is just a creature that brings a couple of tokens along with it, but it can be dashed so you can return it to your hand and make those tokens every turn. There's also a ton of payoffs for humans entering the battlefield, like with Theoden, Borogond, and Urkenbrand. Theoden will give something double strike every time a human enters, Baragond gives all of your creatures plus one plus one and vigilance, and Urkenbrand will also give all your creatures plus one plus zero, and all of these trigger whenever humans enter, right? So you make multiple tokens, you get lots and lots of triggers, right? Gets very powerful. Also, your commander makes multiple tokens every turn. We also care a lot about attacking, so we have like Frontier Warmonger, Combat Celebrant, Shared Animosity. The Warmonger gives all your stuff menace, so it's harder for them to be blocked. Celebrant gives you extra combat steps, and the Enchantment gives each creature plus one plus zero for each other attacking creature that shares a creature type with it. While we do have a wide range of knights, soldiers, and warriors, most of them are humans. I think there's a couple non-humans in the entire deck. Which leads to another minor theme of the deck, which is Monarch. Cards like What's This Guy's Face, Champions of Minas Tirith, and Fourth Yorlingas. I'm really gonna butcher these names, aren't I? Uh, look, they all care about being the Monarch. The main goal of this deck is to attack aggressively, but it also uses the Monarch to gain card advantage, and that makes that card earlier, about drawing the second card every turn, much easier to trigger. You see that now? Right? Makes sense? The alternate commander is Aragorn, which will make you the monarch whenever you cast him, and if you're the monarch, creatures can't block, leaving opponents defenseless. So we have another monarch payoff, but basically, if you like the idea of flooding the board with humans and being the aggressive player at the table, definitely check out Riders of Rohan. Our final deck is Elven Council, a Simic deck with Galadriel, Elven Queen as the commander. It's a 4 mana 4-5 with Will of the Council, which means at the beginning of combat, everyone at the table is going to vote for Dominion or Guidance. So if Dominion wins the vote, the ring tempts you and you put a plus one plus one counter on your ring bearer. And if Guidance wins, or if the vote is tied, you just draw a card. A 4 mana 4 5 that potentially just draws a card every turn. Now, believe it or not, it's kind of, it's kind of weird, but voting is a major theme in this deck. It's, it, it's pretty interesting. We have things like Surden, Elrond, and Plead for Power, all of which have more of this voting mechanic. The first makes everyone secretly choose a player. Every player chosen draws a card, but if someone isn't chosen at all, they get to put a permanent into play from their hand for free, so that's pretty powerful. You almost don't want to be chosen, but if you are, then, well, you get to draw it still, so that's fine. Elrond forces players to either give you one of their creatures or put plus one plus one counters on all the creatures you already have, so that's fine. And Plead for Power forces everyone to vote on whether you get an extra turn or you draw three cards, right? So these effects are pretty much universally in your favor. You just get something good no matter what. But if you want something specific, you can sway the vote with things like Arrestor and Model of Unity. So Arrestor will give 
treasure tokens to anyone who votes with you, right? Encouraging players to agree with your choice. And if somebody doesn't vote with you, well, then you still get to scry. So that's fine. The artifact just lets everyone who voted for you scry, including yourself, because, well, you always, you always vote for the thing you voted for. So you get to scry and other people get to scry too, so long as they vote for your choice. And when this deck isn't forcing the table to vote for things that benefit you, it has a lot of tribal elf synergies and ramp. Not only does it play a lot of traditional elf mana dorks like Arbor Elf, Elvish Mystic, Paradise Druid, but it also has a lot of tribal payoffs like Elvish Arc Druid, Elvish Warmaster, and this ambush thing. The first pumps your elves and makes tons of mana. Elvish Warmaster makes elf tokens and can also pump all of your elves in the late game. And the ambush will make x one ones where X is the number of attacking creatures, and then it prevents damage that non-elves would deal. So you can use this offensively, you can attack and then prevent the damage that your opponents are going to do to your creatures or attackers, or it can be used defensively as like a one-sided fog. Your opponent attacks you, you fog it, but also you get a bunch of blockers that can just kill stuff. So yeah, pretty cool. And all of this feels very on theme, right? The elves kind of dirtle around with voting and ramp and they're not super involved with the battle. But sooner or later, just like in the books or the movies, they have no choice. They have to enter the battlefield. And that's when you start seeing things like Genesis Wave, Raise the Palisade, and Overwhelming Stampede come into play. So Genesis Wave can put a bunch of free stuff into play from the top of your library. And while I haven't talked about it, there are a bunch of big hits for this. This deck does ramp and it ramps into some big stuff. Raise the Palisade lets you choose a creature type, then return everything to hand that's not that type. So of course you name Elf and you bounce all your opponent's boards, leaving them open to attack. And Stampede will pump all your Elves based on the highest power among creatures you control. And once again, not only do we have big creatures, but we also have Elves that get bigger with time. So basically this deck kind of dirtles around. It's like not super involved. And then it explodes in the late game. As for the alternate commander, there are many. There are tons of Simic legends in this deck. But the true alternate commander, I believe, is Gandalf. He says whenever you play big spells, everyone reveals the top card of their library until they reveal a non-land. And then if that card shares a card type with the spell you cast, you get to copy all their spells. So yeah, this deck does have a lot of ramp and big stuff. So Gandalf is kind of like a card advantage machine after you get done ramping. So yeah, anyway, if you want to play a very, I would say thematically correct Lord of the Rings elf deck, then check out Elven Council. So yeah, there you go. Those are the Lord of the Rings commander decks. I will leave Amazon affiliate links in the description below. And as always, I will encourage you not to click those links and support a local game store if you have one. I will also leave links to the full deck list if you want to check out every card and every individual deck and be sure to let me know in the comments which deck you're most interested in but in the meantime thanks for watching and i will see you in the next one